own triumphant life story? If so, this podcast is for you. Listen to powerful guests who have persevered through challenges so you can gain strength to build your championship life. The host of Professor of Perseverance Podcast, Dr. James Perdue. Well, again, thank you for coming in. It's that time again of the day to get some inspiration, get some fired up motivation, to get some knowledge and education on what to do to help you get through your suffering, your trials and tribulations, your difficulties, your adversity, your challenges. All right. Hey, that's what this podcast is about, is helping one another get through some difficulty. So when you get to the other side, they'll know that life is worth living and having a good life, not one that we feel like we're suffering all the time. Hey, I'm Dr. James Perdue, the professor of perseverance. I am him, right? The professor of perseverance. And thank you for coming in on this professor of perseverance podcast. Again, this podcast couldn't have made it without you coming in, listening and sharing it out. Today, our guest, she is from Haiti. All right. Her and her, her and her family were not uh, what you would say wealthy, all right. She had to work multiple jobs to put herself through college and medical school. She became an OBGYN, and wouldn't you know it, something life comes and happens again, and she had to quit her job to educate her children. Now we'll get to the reason of that here as she's speaking, all right. And the reason for leaving, she also. Hold on here. There we go. She uh, also, during this time, colon cancer. Not once, but twice, and we'll get into that as well. All right. So, let's go to get started. The, 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 what is it? The, oh, the author and memoir of her book is called uh, Pressure Makes Diamonds From Homeschooling to the Ivy League A Parenting Story. Welcome to the show. Dr. Caroline oh, Kervacor. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, no. Thank you for sharing your uh, valuable time with us and, and your insight. And so we got a copy of your book for people that are looking already here. So uh, go hunt it up on Amazon. Pressure Makes Diamonds. Okay. From Homeschooling to the Ivy League, A Parenting Story. So... I'm sure you got your your multiple stories all through there. And how long did it take you to write your book? I started one November when it's like the nano write things, and I wrote every single day, and I finished it like about in January. So oh, wow. that was my first draft. Then, of course, you have to go through multiple drafts, but it's it was it's four years in the making. But the initial concept and start to finish, and I wrote almost every single day. That took me about three months. Wow. Took me 12 years to write my first book. <laughs> I would, I would, I would write like, uh, I don't know, a page of a book and then I'd put it down, wouldn't even touch it for two months, then come back and write three pages. Then I may not touch it for six months. Uh, I just tell people, you know, how often we change our computer. I said, it's a blessing in itself, a miracle in itself that I didn't lose that manuscript <laughs> from computer to computer to computer to computer. I said, cause I'm sure I would not have started over. So, wow. But I'm glad, That's... glad that you did that. That's awesome. So, Thank all right, you. Doc. Doc, appreciate you being here. And let's get you on here and move your book for a few minutes okay. here. All right, Doctor. Appreciate you again you being here and going to help us. And, uh, you know, we, we all need something to get us uh, going through the day. And so let's uh, go ahead and start off with your story. Uh, you come from, uh, from Haiti. Right. And made your way up to here? Yeah, I came in 1968 with my brothers and sisters, and um, I was five years old at the time. And we moved to Brooklyn, New York. And we were one of the first Black families to move in a white neighborhood. So the reception at that time was not very good. The kids did not want to play with us. They teased us. They threw rocks at us. And my father, not wanting confrontation, you know, we are new in this country. He just basically sheltered us at home. You know, we went to school and back home. We didn't have a lot of friends. 
But then we fought back one day because we were tired of being bullied. We were tired of that. And they respected us after we fought back. We started having friends. But then, of course, a lot of the white families moved out and black and Hispanic families moved in. But and this is my thing for having five kids because my brothers and sisters were my best friends. And during those turbulent moments when we first came and I was so little, um, they did everything. My parents worked multiple jobs. So my brothers and sisters and my grandmother basically was all we had. And so we grew close and I really appreciate that. So I kind of wanted the same thing for my biracial children. My husband's white, he's a physician. And um, I wanted to have that family upbringing like I had, because I loved it. You know, when you're poor and you're a kid, you don't know that. You're just happy. You know, kids are happy until- Oh they yeah, yeah, exactly. I know the feeling. We were not what you considered uh, poor, poor, but we were knocking on that door. And yeah. <laughs> kids, I mean, adults, the parents, they know how bad things are right. trying to make ends meet. Right. But as kids, we have no idea how poor we are. We just know that we're going to have a good old day and you go at right. it. Yeah. Yeah. And for Christmas, I remember Christmas, we didn't get a lot of toys. We got the basics. We got pajamas and, and socks and things like that. But my parents were home and we had soup and we had food and sometimes my uncles came and it was just such a festive time that for me when kids would, would go back to school and they would say you know what you get for christmas it wasn't really about that for me it was seeing relatives that i haven't seen in a while it was about us we would play puzzles we would get like five thousand piece puzzles that we always got every year and i still do that with my kids and we would just have such a great time drinking eggnog and working on the puzzle. And that was that was fun, you know? That was that was uh, simpler days. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Oh yeah, yeah. What'd you give for Christmas? I got these nice pair of socks. And they're looking <laughs> and they're looking at you like, what, what are you talking about? Yeah. So yeah, I, I know the feeling on that as well. So we got the uh, bare basics. We probably got a brand new pair of blue jeans to finish out the year. One exactly. nice shirt, and then it's underwears and socks, and <laughs> and fortunately we did get you know some toy, a little yeah. you know nice toy, but it yeah. wasn't like uh, it would be with people today. It's given fourteen thousand toys and yeah. presents and whatever else. Yeah. So, all right. So, well, I'm sorry that uh, when you moved here, you had that bad experience with the. Uh, but I hate I hate to say that it's that time. That's the way it was back then. The people were, and I'm glad, and and glad things are better mm -hmm. than they were in '68 uh, today. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not perfect. We still got a long way to go. I know. And eventually, we're we're going to make the rounds, and things are going to get. Again, it may not be perfect, but it's going to get better and better. I think so. I'm hopeful. You know, when people say, "Oh my God, this is the end of the world," I said, "I said, do you know history? Do you know?" everything that's been going on, you know, we're making little, little progress. And maybe for some people, it's not fast enough, but I like to believe that things do get better. Yes. I, I'm, I'm like that too. Uh, again, it may not say huge improvements and I'm dead and gone, but uh, it, it we're, we're slowly moving that way. Yeah, we so, are. And I'm glad it, that's way it, it should be. We, we're all humans. I don't care yeah. what color your skin is right. and all this other gender identity stuff. I don't care all that. We're all humans, basic humans. And right. the main thing, main thing, we don't have to agree with everybody, but we should respect everybody. Beautiful. Well said. I love that. So, all right. Now, uh, Doc, let's, uh, let's get into, um, so you work your way through college, paid your way with working your own jobs and everything, got to medical and became Dr. O-B-G-Y-N. Mm -hmm. And uh, appreciate your help taking care of everybody like that, the women folk. And so, uh, Why'd you have, why'd you, we mentioned it in the intro, you had to stop your job and educate your children. What, what happened here? Yeah, my husband and I, we both grew up in New York and we kind of wanted to leave New York at some point. And so we both found good paying jobs, very good paying job in central Pennsylvania. They really needed doctors. And so um, we figured we'll stay here for a couple of years make some money and probably move to Maryland. We had some family in Maryland and I've always liked Maryland. Um, well, five years later, five kids later, we're still there. <laughs> we're raising our kids. We find it's a fairly good place to raise kids. It's not expensive. The crime rate is low. Um, so we 
we stayed. And um, once my kids started school, though, that became a different issue because my kids were so small, especially my oldest. And the school district and I did not see eye on a lot of things. And it was always an argument. So eventually she was bored. She didn't want to go to school. Then my second one didn't want to go to school because he was used to walking around and he didn't want to be confined. And then the, you know, it hit the fan when, when my Nick, my middle child, he was three years old at the time and he got injured by a babysitter. We had no family in the area and it was so hard for us. We had babysitters quitting on us or not showing up, not calling. And I had surgeries to do. My husband has to go, you know, you know, in the OR and people, when you schedule them for a hysterectomy or for whatever, they take part of their vacation. They have family members to come to take care of them. They plan these. I can't call in sick. You know, you can't do that. But some days I had to, and I felt awful. And so it was a nightmare working. And when my husband was on call, I couldn't be on call. We had to arrange our schedule in a way, you know, we didn't take like vacations around the same time because it was just so hard, different specialties. So when that happened, when I came, when my babysitter called us, called me at my office, I was having office hours, you know, you got to come home, you got to come home quickly. Um, I left the, you know, I had my other physician friends, colleagues, you know, cover my patients. And I ran home and my, my son's face was swollen. And at the end of the day, you know, my husband, we fired her and my husband says, we can't go on like this. One of us have to quit their job. It's just, it was getting too much. And so we all knew who it would be. You know, I wanted the five kids. He only wanted two. And so (laughs) I ended up quitting my job. (laughs) But when I quit my job, I knew that I wanted to homeschool them because I was having a problem with the school district anyway. So everything kind of just fell in place. It was terrifying because I never expected to do that. I never planned to do that. I did love my job a lot. Um, But once I did, I enjoyed it. It, I just didn't look back. And um, I know a lot of people, when bad things happen, you kind of want to find a silver lining. Like, you know, why does bad things happen? Like people say, you know, it happens for a reason and everybody's trying to make sense of it. But I know that once when I got sick and my diagnosis was 53% survival rate the first time stage three colon cancer, um, that was the only thing I said that I was glad I had stopped working and I stayed with my kids because, you know, you put things on the back burner. Oh, yeah, you'll have time to do this. You'll have time. And then you don't, you know. And so for me. That was one of the positive things. When I had the cancer, when I was diagnosed with it, I said, okay, those last 10 years of, you know, that I had with my kids were some of my best moments. And I was saying, if I had to get cancer, you know, I'm happy that it was now and not before, you know, or I'm happy that I had quit my job because, you know, when you're dead, you don't wish you had more time in the office. You wish you had more time with your family. And for me, I did. So that was one way I was looking at my situation to make it sound, to make it seem better. Yes. And and like like you were saying is whenever something happens, we try to find why is this going on? What am I supposed to learn from this? And we may not know or learn anything for years Mm -hmm. on why something happened. And so, I mean, I'm sorry, your son got abused with the babysitter but it kind of turned out to be a blessing in itself because like you said, it got you out of the office, uh, out of the career. Sorry you had to leave that. Uh, but again, you were able to recognize your own health at that time. And mm-hmm. if you're not healthy, there's no way you can help take care of them five children. Exactly. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Well, Six children, your husband. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah. So, you know, so if you're not healthy, you can't take care of the family. Right. And so, Sorry for again for the mishap or whatever with the babysitter thing, but then you got to turn and yeah, it was a blessing that, that got you where you needed to focus to get right. yourself healthier, right? And so, when I write the book from homeschooling to the Ivy League, it's not really about homeschooling, it's about the journey that we all go through because you don't homeschool in a vacuum you get sick while you're homeschooling. You have earthquake in your native country while you're homeschooling that devastates you. You have the 
Trayvon Martin killing, that was the first time that I had to really sit down with my kids and talk about racism in the country and really explain to them different situation. And so all that is covered in the book because all of those are learning moments that you have to teach your kids. It's part of education. So I always tell my kids that education doesn't happen in a brick and mortar from nine to three. It's all around you. You're always learning. Also, when I got cancer, that was a learning experience for them. I had to explain to them what happened and and how it happens and how they have to be tested. Now, 10 years, you know, it was 49 years. I was, I just turned 49. So um, cancer, colon cancer is supposed to be a slow growing cancer. So they believe that it happened 10 years before you even diagnose it. There. So this is why my kids have to be um, screened at 39. And so we had a whole discussion of that because you don't stop learning. You never. And so one of the student teacher once told me that, oh, you know, I don't understand homeschool parents because what happens if you run out of material? And I'm thinking, Do you, I don't think I could live enough lifetime to run out of educational material. You know, the sad, lingu- the sad thing, I was, I was an educator and I quit for health reasons. Uh, but yeah, a teacher in the education system might run out of materials because they don't know to go out and, but I don't say they, a lot of them won't go out and get other things to make it where it's educational. They just want to do the book thing and get done and do their thing. All right. So, but when you're homeschooling, you have tremendous resource, amount of resource. And again, you don't have to stick particularly on that curriculum that they still have to pass. I mean, how many people are, like you said, an earthquake in Haiti and where you're from, and you're telling your children, you've got relatives down there still, and we got to we got to check on them. We've got to right. see how they made it through and explain, you know, the situation. Or, like I said, Trayvon Martin on, on what's going on, and now, you know, everybody else, it's 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 out there whether we like it or not. Exactly. The, uh, racism. And exactly. so, you know, so we got to help improve on that as well. So yeah, yeah, but yeah, I, I commend you tremendously for jumping oh, in in other areas. I mean, because again, it could have been just been easy. All right, we got math today. Yeah. All right, let's get them uh, social studies book open. Oh no, we can, we can't talk about Haiti and what's going on in our homeland. We got to talk about what happened here in I don't know. Uh, yeah. Nazis uh, during that time, you know, and not to say that's not important. I'm right. just saying, I'm not saying that's not important. I'm just saying that you can open up when you're homeschooling to teach other areas as well exactly. and, and and go. So yeah, I, I commend you for jumping overboard and, and going outside the area with it. And, you know, and kids know what they want to learn too. And you have to, if that's what they're interested in at that moment, you can't shield them from that and you got to respect them. And and sometimes every once in a while, they'll ask me a question. That I don't know. I said, that's a really good question. I didn't think of that. Let's go find out. And I think they like that honesty. You know, if you don't know. And I then they was like, mom, how could you not know? I said, because I'm human. I'm, and they need to understand that. You may not know everything. And then they, will, then they start saying, hey, wait, maybe I could learn something. And every once in a while, they'll tell me something that, you know, they said, oh, the students become better than the teacher. And I said, that's fine. It's meant to be like that, you know. You will teach yourself on things that you're interested in, and it was like new to them. It wasn't just me feeding them all the information. No, you could go look it up yourself, and we could talk about it. And so it really got to be. And, and unfortunately, too, when I was sad, when I got when I got cancer, they proceeded without me. And at some point, I'm thinking, oh my God, is this life? Am I seeing a play, Life After Mom? Like things go along without me, you know, and some of it is a lot. (laughs) I got you. Yes. Yes. But that's what you want, though. You want independent thinkers. You want people to go out. You want your kids to be strong enough and smart enough and curious enough to learn information on their own. And so, and they were doing that. It it was a little painful. I was thinking I might be done then, you know, but at the same time, there was a part of me that was okay. I did what I needed to do. I forgot who it was, but uh, one person had told me that they believe part of their philosophy of education was, you know, I'll teach them the uh, 20 percent of what needs to be known. Let them have the 80 percent to go find the answers. They'll remember it more if they have to hunt for it than if I just give it to them. 
That is so true. I, I do agree in a part because of that. I do. And I, I used to teach science. And so we got to do a lot of, you know, science, you could do a lot of hands-on experience, experiments, mm -hmm. you know, uh, activities. Mm -hmm. and, and so, plus it, it made my day go quicker too. <laughs> yeah. Cause I, I love the activity days as much as they did. And cause, <laughs> cause, cause it's just watching them all of a sudden see that little light bulb go off that, uh, they finally figured out something. That is so wonderful when that light bulb goes off. Oh my God, the Eureka moment, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and you live for that. All right, now, so so you went through your colon cancer to get because it was two stages here, two, yes. two different times. And so um, your your children, they're taking on the education without you uh, on yes. part of it uh, while you're doing your treatments and when you're not feeling good on some days and their continue on, which was great to show us how they have uh, matured as mm -hmm. they were getting uh, growing up. So that's that's awesome. And so, um, so you beat the colon cancer the first time. Right. You said a 50, 53 percent survival rate, right. and so you're in that fifty three percent now uh, of it. And so now you're feeling great about yourself. And so, what happened then? Oh well, that the first time I just knew that this was not going to stop me, you know, and even with the homeschooling, um, I gave my kids the choice. Two of them, one of them had just graduated. She was in college, my oldest. Two of them wanted to go to school and two of them did not. And so I had, it was a 12 week treatment every other week. So it was 24 weeks. And one week I was out. The following week, the kids had work on their own. I would leave work for them and they would do it. And then the week that I was okay, we would go through it together. And so we were doing AP human geography and a few other courses. And so six weeks or so, I was alert. I was cooking. I was doing everything like this cancer is not going to stop me. But by 12 week, it stopped me. By 12 week, I could not even get out of bed, even on my good day. And I was like, it, it was hard. It was, you know, I was starting to lose my hair. Not a lot. It thinned out. But by 12 week, I was starting to feel a little defeated, you know, and I kept saying, you're almost done. You're almost done. And my sister flew in to be with me at that last week. And that really helped. Um, and so I finished it. I, once I finished that treatment, I felt on top of the world. I said, yes, I did it. I beat cancer. I was ecstatic. I was like, okay, I could tackle the world. I could tackle anything. Two years later, it comes back. Mm. I was not prepared for that. I don't know why I wasn't prepared, but normally I'm a planner. I like seeing things five years down the road and planning effectively. And my kids were like dual enroll in, because I always thought if something happened to my husband or whatever, I need to go back to work. We had a loose homeschooling structure. And I know that the schools are more structured and I wanted my kids to kind of be as, used to that. So because I was planning down the road. I didn't want it to be a shock to them in case I had to go back to work or whatever. So I've always planned ahead. I did not think I would need to plan ahead for my cancer. I did not think it would come back. So when it came back the second time, I was not as strong. I felt a little defeated. Um, the drugs that they put me on, I lost my hair. I was bald like within a week or so. And I was on this Avastin. One thing about Avastin, now that I'm a stage four, I was only giving 11% survival at that time. 11%. 11%, five-year survival. They told me 36 months that I would, if I make it that far, and it was in my lungs. So I had to have surgery in my lower lungs that was removed completely, and I had to start chemo. Um, this time, they put me on this Avastin. And what Avastin does is that because it's stage four means that it's traveled through your body, um, it, in the vascular system, you could have bleeds. And periodically, I would wake up with nosebleed. And I had to go to the hospital to get it cauterized because it wouldn't stop bleeding. But I had headaches. And I felt that I'm going to bleed in my head. That is one of the side effects, an aneurysm. And I'm going to die. And the headaches were so severe. And I closed down on myself. I did not talk to my husband. They wanted me to go to therapy. Um, and I went one time and I never went again because I, I don't like talking. I said, I'm depressed. I know I'm depressed. I'm depressed because I'm giving 11 year survival. What is therapy going to do? Unless you're going to take away my cancer, it's not doing anything for me. And I didn't want to talk to my brothers and sisters. 
because I felt I was letting them down. I couldn't talk to my husband. So I had no one to talk to. If I had to do it over, I would not have done that approach because yes. I didn't want to burden them, you know, and my kids, you know, what that's could the, they... that's the, that's the bingo word of the day did not want to burden them. Yes. Didn't want them to get caught up with everything going on with you. You didn't want to drag their life down with exactly. you feeling bad. Yeah. I understand that when I first got injured, I felt like I was a burden to my family when I get, when I uh, got paralyzed. And, he, you know, they're helping me dress, helping me feed me, helping me get into bed, out of bed, in a car, out of a car. And I feel so much like a burden. So yeah, I know exactly what you're talking on that spot when you're talking there. And you just didn't want them yes. to be brought down to that level. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, go ahead. So basically, I isolated myself in my bedroom. My husband would bring food for me when he could, you know, like if I could eat or tolerate it. But basically, I just isolated myself. Um, and my kids didn't even come often to see me in my room because it was just too depressing. And I just didn't want to see anyone. I was really closing down, but I think I was also living in fear. I kept saying, am I going to die tomorrow? Am I going to die the next day? I, is an aneurysm going to burst in my head? And I know this is about perseverance, but I was at the point where I had to give up. And to be honest with you, because I couldn't live in fear anymore, um, I had to say, okay, you know what? This has been the best years of my life. I love my husband to death. I love my kids to death, but I don't want to die like this. I don't want to die a coward. I don't want to die in fear. And when I made up my mind to stop my cancer, I didn't finish the treatment. I was too, the headaches were so bad. They were pounding. I told my husband, is it okay if I stop my treatment? You know, my brothers and sisters, I have two physicians in my family besides myself. They were so angry. No, you can't. You have to fight. And I was like, you don't get to decide on my life. And I asked my husband, I said, I married you for better or for worse. You're the only one that could have an input in how I die. And he told me, and I would never do that. He says, that is your life. You decide. He said, I will support whatever decision you want. And I stopped my chemo. I said, that's, a, that's a great answer by him. Yeah. You know, I, I, selfishly, I selfishly, I can tell you what I want and hope <laughs> that you would follow, you know, because I want you to stay around. Uh, he could have said, you know, selfishly. Yeah, but what mm -hmm. he said, you know, this is your life. Yes. yes. I want you to be in it as long as possible with me. Yes. But I also want what you think is best for you. Right. And again, I will support you. That is the best answer that could be given. That was awesome for him to, to think that, like that. That's why I love him so much. And we've been married for like 28 years now. And there you go. Amen, <laughs> sister. So um, I stopped halfway. It was a 12 weeks. I stopped about after six weeks. And I the headaches stopped. The nosebleeds stopped. And I took control of my life again. And um, there was this thing that my my son, when I was homeschooling, then we would do these contests. And he had written a letter, um, letters to literature, and you write it to a, an author. And we did this almost every year. And he wrote to Natalie Babbitt about um, Tux Everlasting and then about the tree of life, not dying. And then he says that, you know, people should not be afraid of dying because because that was when his grandfather, that was the first death, his grandfather on my husband's side of the family had died of of he had pancreatic cancer he survived that and then years later he died of a heart attack and so when we first lost him um that was the first time my kids experienced that and so he's you know like why does people have to die because his grandfather just died and it was so painful but then he realized that if he thinks of the good things that he did with his grandfather he will always cherish his grandfather. You know, like it's not oh, yeah. how long you live, it's the quality of your life that matters. Something that Martin Luther King some, said something similar, but he mm -hmm. didn't, we didn't even do Martin Luther King at that time. So for his thinking on that was so profound. I loved it. So I went back to my office, my room right now, my favorite room, and I went to their portfolio and I read it over and it gave me the strength that I needed. And I said, okay, I'm done. I'm going to be active. I'm going to be the mom, the teacher, I'm going to be active in my kid's life for as long as it may be. It may be a week, it may be a month, but I'm going to be present because I wasn't present. For the last three months, I was hibernating in a cave and I was awful and I was fearful. And I said, I'm going to face death because I, 
I can't live the way I was living. And once I did that, and I prepared to, I even went to the funeral home and I didn't want my kids having to do anything. I prepared my cremation. I did everything. I'm sorry. I thought I had turned this off. No, it's okay. You're good. I'm sorry. This was off anyway. So, um, yeah. And once I was not afraid of dying, I started living and the 11% survivor rate and everything else that they had told me that was wrong. And some people, I don't call it positive thinking. I just call it the loss of fear because I think fear would have caused me to die much sooner, you know, and I didn't want to live like that anymore. And so that was my perseverance was I was just going to face death and just going to live my best life for as ever long it could be. And as ever long it could be. Yes. And you're right about fear. Fear holds us back from attempting to live better. Uh, What if what if I go try and do this and I fail? What if I go and try to do this and then I'm, I don't know, 100,000 in the hole and it never happened? You know, what if I go do this? And then because all that, they talked yourself out of trying to have a better life. Exactly. Okay? And, and same thing with fear of death. I don't think I'm afraid of death. And I'm uh, doctor. Don't don't send no psychiatrist to my house. But <laughs> I've already had I had to see one for a year. I attempted suicide three times in three days. That's how bad I wanted out. Oh, and wow. And I was found last time I was found uh, sucking carbon monoxide poisoning out of my van in my garage. Oh, and wow. so and I was in the hospital for seven weeks and, and stuff. I'm not afraid of death. OK, when it's my time, I'm ready to go. <laughs> I'm good because I know where I'm going to be at the end of this. I won't be in the wheelchair anymore. I won't be hurting and suffering and pain. I'm going to be up there walking around with Jesus, uh, whatever, however people believe it, that whatever who they believe into or whatever, I'm letting you know that's what I believe. And, and I'm not condemning anybody else's whatever mm-hmm. they believe. But beautiful, I just know where I'm going to be. And, and I'm not afraid of the de- uh, death uh, from, from, and it may be because I attempted it and I don't know, but I'm not afraid. I, I'm, I'm from that, but I understand fear of death from mm-hmm. people because one, you don't know, uh, what's going to happen. You don't know if you're going to, you don't know if there's a heaven or not. Some people, mm-hmm. okay. They're, they they do not know how their family's going to make it without them, you mm-hmm. know, and, and how they're going to leave scars on their children, you know, mm-hmm. from the death. And, and I, I understand all that. I don't have any children, but I understand that, yeah, the fear of, of what could happen when you die because you're not there to help prepare with everybody. But exactly. uh, yeah, I think once you, once you got past that uh, fear mm-hmm. and now it's time to live and live the best you can for as long as you can, whatever the timetable may be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can see that. Uh, I can see that helping more than the, to me, it sounds like you're neither going to die of the colon cancer or you're going to die of the treatment. Yeah. <laughs> it's, what it's, it's what it sounds like with me with the exactly. headaches and the and extra bleeding and everything like that. And right. so, yeah, uh, I praise, praise you big time on, uh, on moving uh, past that uh, fearfulness mm-hmm. and look where you're at today. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes doctors are wrong. And in this case, they were. You know, so I really think that the chemo would have killed me. I, I was just so awful. I was miserable. I lost a lot of weight. I just I just couldn't, you know, and, and, and the kids were watching this. And this is not the last moments how I didn't want them to remember me like that. I wanted them to remember me as a playful mom. And so I wasn't really, I'm not really afraid of the afterlife. You know, I just. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm again, more, it's the fearfulness. Yeah. You, didn't, you didn't want your kid to see you bald, exactly, exactly. withering away, being weak, exactly. and didn't want to leave that scar on exactly. them, thinking exactly. their last image of mom was. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. no, I, I, under, yeah. I mean, I understand it's not the dying right. thing because once you're dead, you're not fearful of anything. Exactly. Okay. You know, <laughs> it's just the worry we have before then. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. So, and that was it. And so, um, so I have this quote in the book about um, when it's only when it's dark enough, can you see the stars? And I've reached such a dark part of my life. And in writing the book, actually, that part, I wrote that part in a full day the whole, my whole cancer thing. 
And then afterwards I cried because I did not revisit. I didn't even want to talk about my cancer, you know, stage um, with anyone. Even after I passed it, it was something that I went through. Let's close it up and let's not ever talk about it. So when I was writing the book, that's the first time I actually had a chance to reflect on that. And I just, and I think everybody tells me that's part of the best writing in the book because I really poured my heart out to it. I needed to do that. And then after I wrote it, I, I cried, I cried and then I felt better. Um, it was really therapeutic for me, that, that section. That, that's but, what I, when I wrote my book, the first one in my memoir, and, and yeah, I felt it was more of a therapeutic for me mm -hmm. than helping someone else at that time. Yeah. And so it was just me being able to open up what I've bottled up all this time and be able to open up and finally put it out there for mm -hmm. someone else, you know, to help someone else. But again, yeah, writing is very therapeutic. And, it is. and people journaling or right. however you want to put it. Yeah, that's, that's a, they need to be able to open up to, to right. help themselves. Right. So, Sorry. Uh, um, we appreciate you uh, being on here. We about run out of time now. So, oh, wow. This was so fast. We oh, a lot about a lot of I'm things. not a professional, I'm not a professional podcaster, but we try to have fun and inspire other people as well. And, uh, you know, we all go through something, some people more than others, mm -hmm. uh, some people more severe than others. Uh, but we're in this all in the same boat that we're all going to go through something and we're all going to get out of it and move on. Uh, just do we move on it on eggshells or do we move on it on ice skates and get out there the best as possible? Mm -hmm. So. I agree with that. Um, and, and I think that we each have to kind of look into ourselves and find our strengths. There's going to be a lot of chatters, you know, about what you should do, but you should really look inside yourself. And these things that you go through, you come out on the other side, you really learn a lot about yourself, a lot about your strength that you never knew you even had, you know, but when push comes to shove and you defeat it and you stood up, you're like, wow, did I really do that? You know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's one of my things. I, I, I'm a firm believer Sometimes we go through things, maybe not every time. Sometimes we go through things, it's to, or tragedies, challenges, you want to say things, suffering, and it's to show us how strong we really are. Yeah. And then again, we built on this knowledge of what we did to get through it to make it easier to get through the next tragedy. Okay. Yeah. And then again, I'm a firm believer we should help other people get through their stuff and then they can help other people as well. That is beautiful. I love that. So, passing on, passing it forward. There we go. It's a, uh, yep, 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 yep. What, what's it called? Uh, well, spreading the, spreading the wealth and, yeah, pay, paying it forward. Pay it forward, yeah. Pay it forward, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so, I yeah. Guess that's what we should leave the audience with today. Good, do good and pay it forward and your strength and your courage, pass it on. Yes, and, and, the biggest thing on this is don't don't expect anything in return either. Exactly. You know, if something somebody wants to somehow pay you back, whatever for help, and you know that's them wanting to, you know, to, to bless and gift you as well. Right. Okay. Right. But, but don't you expect. Out, when, yeah, when you go out and do it, mm -hmm. don't expect anything because your your biggest thing is you're helping someone else. So. Yeah. I hey, I, I tell people, we, yeah, all of us have a gift. All right. And we all have different gifts. We all have strength, uh, strong gifts. We have, you know, we have different gifts as well. Uh, for ex uh, example, I tell uh, if my neighbor next door is an elderly person and they can't mow the yard, I'm in a wheelchair. I can't mow the yard, but I can make a phone call to a friend and get him over there to mow the yard. OK. And to help out. Mm -hmm. Um we, we don't have to spend money to help people. We just use our natural gift that we can help someone. Uh, one one woman uh, I met, she'll cut out coupons. She'd do the couponing thing to save money for her, but she'll cut out enough coupons that she'll actually put them on the shelves <laughs> at the store where yeah. the jelly is or where the bread is or where the meat is. 
for anybody else to pick it up and be able to use them. It, I've so never I've never seen a person do that, but I've seen coupons with something I want to buy. And I'm thinking, what a nice person. You know, that is just so wonderful to do. You know, I can't use them. I don't need it, but I'll leave it for the next person. You know, that is so amazing. So I've never seen a person actually leave it, but I've always thanked them, especially if I, you know, use it, I could need yeah. it, you know, but that's no, so I've, 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 I've never seen anybody leave them before either. Uh, but I met this one woman and I got her book. And in her book, she says she did that. She does wow. that. And so uh, to, so that's her little gift, you know, to be yeah, able to bless someone beautiful. else later. So, all right, doctor, I appreciate okay. you coming in. And so uh, to tell everybody how we can find your uh, book. Up, and I'll put it back up again. How they can okay. find your book, uh, any website, social media, they can get a hold of you. My website actually is, you'll see my Meet My Kids. I call it that too. If you go on my website, it's my name, www.colleenkrevkar.com. And then that's my website. And on my website, you'll see where my book, you could get my book on Amazon or bookshop.org. And, um, and then on my website also, if you want to follow me on Facebook or Instagram, I don't post a lot. So I tell people, you know, I post where I'm going to be in town or things like that, but I don't really post a lot. Um, and then I just won my school board race, first black woman on the school board. So that's keeping me pretty busy. So um, I'm yeah. glad you mentioned that because I wanted to bring that up as well, that uh, you using your homeschooling benefit education there and i'm glad you brought it up because uh, i was going to mention about how you were now taking your time that you're on the board of education yes. where you live um, yep. i forgot to, i forgot until you mentioned about but we didn't be the first uh, black woman or first african-american however you want to look at it and uh yeah yeah so thank you Oh, that's happy. awesome as well. Again, adding now we now now you're leaving a legacy there because now you're you're leaving you're adding some diversity into the program and mm -hmm. ideas for people to leave, uh to build on. So right. now see, look at you, look at you <laughs> hanging in there, hanging in there like a, a hair in a biscuit, and that's what we say in the <laughs> south. We say that in the south here, a hair in a biscuit, and so with you hanging in like that, uh, look what you've done uh, throughout life here. I'm so glad that uh, you and I've met and uh, on this uh, podcast. Uh, you've been a blessing for me. Uh, well, you got me all fired up today. I've got to, I got to go out and go do something now so I can uh, uh, pass this blessing on to somebody. Wonderful, so, uh, you do that. I, will I appreciate do you doing it. Now, the last thing here, I know you mentioned your quote earlier, but uh, we know there's people hurting and suffering today. If you can leave us with a positive message, uh, how they could get through today, uh, mm -hmm. that would be an awesome, awesome blessing for us. I think to reach out to family members, people that love you, because don't shut them out like I did. I know that they want to help. And sometimes just reach out and just, and just, you just, sometimes it's just to hear their voice, you know, reach out when you're feeling low and just give them a call. You don't even have to tell them what it's for. Cause sometimes just to hear my sister's voice or my brother's voice, it just makes my day. And so when you're feeling down, just reach out to someone. That's what I would, because that's what I do. And it helps. Amen, sister. Yeah, good. And again, they don't have to know the purpose of you exactly. feeling bad or something. I exactly. mean, put a happy face on while you're talking to them so they don't catch on why. Exactly. And just to talk and communicate, uh, exactly. go out to lunch with them, have a family reunion, something yeah, that's going to help. I, I agree with you. Uh, Family, family is is huge, mm -hmm. either way. Yes, in the either good way. or the, in the good or the bad. Right, and and hopefully we're more in the good. So yes, Doc, appreciate you coming on, and I'll take your uh, website and stuff and and your Amazon link and put in the show notes for make it easier for people to go find you and uh, okay. hopefully get your book and everything. So thank again, you so much. Thank you for blessing you. us and blessing me. I really thoroughly enjoyed your your positive outcome and your persevering so thank appreciate you. it all all right thank you hey everybody else is coming in on the replay so i've been watching here i've seen several of you popping in and out so i know you've been watching and so thank you for coming in leaving those likes i appreciate that and so but everybody else is coming in on the podcast on the replay be sure to share this out this has been a very good good one not to say the other's not been very good but this has been <laughs> one that's fired me up today and so we really appreciate it. So 
Everybody else do something today, tomorrow, something next week that's going to help you persevere past your paralysis.